Again, we're so glad that you joined us this weekend. We have a great weekend planned for you, um, an incredible message ahead. My name's Pastor Chris Van Halen, I'm our lead pastor of Life Groups and Campuses. This is Carson Carroll. He's our pastor over Life Groups in Singles. And I'm telling you, we have some great things ahead for everyone. We, uh, we have some events coming up we want to let you know. But if it's your first time with us, I just want to pause and say welcome. Thanks for joining us this weekend at Woodlands Church. And if you want to get connected further here at Woodlands Church, there's a card in your bulletin that says get connected. Fill that out. We want to get you plugged in to the ministries and missions here at Woodlands Church. We want to get you in a life group. We want to get you serving on the weekend. That's how you meet people here at Woodlands Church. So make sure you fill that out and drop that in the offering at the end of the service. Yeah, and speaking of getting connected, if you are a single adult, we have a special event just for you next weekend, Saturday night, right after service. We're going to have a singles bingo night. Um, we had a singles night uh, several months ago, and it was a huge success. We had over 300 people, and so we're going to do it again. We're going to have some fun uh, playing bingo, and so it's $10. That gets you uh, 12 games of bingo, potentially winning prizes uh, if you get a bingo. Um, we also have child care, and that, that $10 also goes towards... Uh, your meal as well. And so uh, come out and join us if you're a single adult, 18 and up. Um, it doesn't matter. Just come and be a part of that um, next weekend. Yeah, and you can pre-register online if you That's want right. to or just show up and be a part of it. It's going to be a great time. Now, if you have kids and they've been involved in any of our summer camps and activities, uh, this summer has been truly a summer of life change. It has been incredible, but we are not done. We still have one more big summer event, and that is VBS. VBS is a day camp. It is four days, uh, the 29th of July through August 1st, so make sure your kids are signed up. We actually have over 900 kids already signed up for VBS. It's going to be an incredible week, and if, you, if you're hearing that and you're like, wow, that's a lot of kids, that takes a lot of volunteers, so if you're sitting here thinking, I could be a part of that, we need you. We need you to be able to serve and to connect with these kids, to love on them this, this week uh, so that they can continue to grow in their relationship with Jesus, and so it's an incredible time, so many skits, games, activities, inflatables, fun, um, but truly a message around who Jesus is and what that looks like to experience him. And so sign up to be a part of that or sign your kids up if you have uh, kids that are potty trained so they don't have to have a, a specific age as long as they are potty trained and then up through fifth grade. So if you are thinking, oh, wait, my, my child is potty trained, this is a week where I have like me time, this is fantastic, sign them up. All right, it's going to be a great time for everyone. Uh, go to wc.org slash VBS, get them signed up, and then you can sign up to volunteer there as well. Yeah, Vacation Bible School is going to be amazing. Uh, but today uh, we have special guest uh, Mark Middleberg along with Pastor Lee Strobel here. And uh, several months ago they did a series on questions and they did some live questions, they did some video questions. Uh, we're going to do the same thing today. Uh, and so if you have any questions, um, we're going to have an opportunity for you later in the service to ask your questions. Um, if you have a question of faith about God um, or, or something like that, you can do that. We'll let you know when that happens. But uh, for now, sit back, relax, enjoy the service, and we're going to sing one more song. I met and the folks who know me Will I discover A soul-saving love Or just the dirt above And below me I'm a doubting Thomas I took a promise But I do not feel safe Can I be 
used to help others find truth When I'm scared I'll find proof that it's a lie Can I be let down a trail dropping breadcrumbs To prove I'm not ready to die Please give me time to decide the signs Please forgive me for time that I have wasted I'm a doubting Thomas I'll take your promise Cause I know nothing safe Well, a few months ago, we tried something unusual. We turned the message time into a question and answer period where we took some live questions from the congregation and we had questions that people had sent in by video or written questions. And uh, we had such a great response, we decided to do it again today. So last week, we put out the word we're going to do this, and we asked you if you have a question that's a spiritual sticking point in your journey toward God, not just Bible trivia, but something that, that really is a serious concern for you, whether it's about God or the Bible or Jesus or faith, uh, to send it in. Well, we got inundated with fantastic questions. I just want to say, you guys are awesome. These questions were terrific. It's so important that when we have questions, that we have a, a place where we can ask them and get answers to satisfy our heart and, and soul. So we're going to do that again this morning. Um, and uh, we're going to have live microphones set up, one over here and one over here. Now, we got so many questions submitted. There's so many good ones we want to cover that we're probably only going to have time to do two or three live ones. But the, uh, the other ones are on video and written and so forth, and we'll get to as many as we can. So to help me out, I brought in from Denver my ministry buddy, Mark Middleberg. We've been doing ministry together for over 30 years. Uh, Mark, I think, is the, uh, the greatest what I call practical apologist. That is, someone who can present the evidence and reasons for the faith and put the cookies on the bottom shelf so people can understand uh, what we're talking about. Uh, he's written um, many books. He sold over three million books. This is the one that I think every Christian should have. It's called The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask with answers. <laughs> so this covers a lot of the kind of material that, uh, you know, is based on questions that people typically ask. He has a master's degree in philosophy of religion from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and um, has been my buddy for, for, as I say, over 30 years. So please help me greet Mark Middleberg. Come on out, Marky. Thank you. And we're going to dive hey. in. Yes, We're going to get started because last, last night we did it and it was like, whoa, Nelly, you just can't, can't cover You want to give as thorough of an answer as you can, but you don't want to go on too long. So you want to cover as many as we can. We've got so many great ones. So we're going to try to have that balance, um, right? Right. It's right. great to be back. Thanks. Yeah. This is a, actually the third time you've done this with us. We yeah. did one, um, uh, as I say, in the auditorium. We did one in the lobby um, pack the place. Pack up. the place. And it's it just, as I say, so important that church be a safe place to ask tough questions, whether it's in a small group setting or in a setting like this. So let's, let's start. Let's go with um, video question number one. My question is, can someone lose their salvation? 
Yeah, now this is a question we got from several people. Can we lose our salvation? And, and some people asked it a little differently or came at it a little differently. Like Valerie said, I struggle with sin that we commit knowingly over and over after we have accepted Christ as our Savior. Many Christians believe that once they're saved, they can do anything and still get into heaven. I have a hard time believing that once we accept Christ's gift, uh, we can then walk all over that gift by doing anything we please even when we knowingly keep committing the same sin over and over. So what do you say to that, Mark? Yeah, well, I agree with the end of what Valerie said there because I, really there's two questions here. Is one is can you lose your salvation? But the other question is can you claim salvation and then live however you want mm -hmm. and still be an authentic Christian? And the Bible is very clear that the answer to that is no. Um, that if we continually, willfully just do whatever we want to do and ignore God's will and what he has said is right, that we're showing by our actions we're not a believer. Um, I, I open to a passage I often quote on this, and it's easy to remember. It's 1, 2, 3, 4. It's 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and it's a sober warning. Uh, John says, we know that we have come to know him. In other words, we've come to know Christ. If we obey him, if we obey his commands... Uh, the person who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in it. So, you know, it's very possible to fool ourselves and to say, well, you know, I, I went to camp or I prayed a prayer or I was baptized at some point, which is great. But if it didn't change you, then it might show that it was maybe a step along the way toward the right thing, but you really haven't had the life change that the Bible describes. Um, the Bible describes, you know, when you follow Christ, it's a change of trajectory in your life. And, it, you know, because we're, we're going this way, we're living our own life, we're living our own way. Then we realize that we're, we're you know, out of God's will, we're disobedient to God, we're in trouble morally. And we come to that point of saying, I'm a sinner who needs a Savior, and we ask him to forgive our sins. But when we do that, we need to ask him to lead our life and help us Turn, which is what the word repent in the Bible means, to turn from my way to his way and to turn around and go that direction. And again, we don't do that perfectly, but the trajectory, the overall course of our life has to change. And if it doesn't, the, again, the Bible would warn us that a lot of people fool themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, there's the verse where in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the apostle Paul says, test yourself. And make sure you're really in the faith. Make sure it's genuine because it, it'll change your course. And that way, too, when you're, you know, when you're following Christ, yes, sometimes we fall into the same things, but our whole perspective is different. You know, it's, it's yeah. not like, oh, well, that's just the way I am. You know, I, that's why God made me. I was born this way or something. No, it's, it's like, oh, I did it again. God, forgive me. Our immediate response is one of regret and one of saying, God, help me, I confess it, help me get back on the, the right track. Even the Apostle Paul said, why do I keep doing these things that I know I shouldn't do? Right, so again, it's, we're not saying you're, you become sinless, or, um, but again, if, if your life hasn't changed at all, mm -hmm. then you gotta say, something's not right in my relationship with God. But back to the other first question on yeah. the video, if you're truly, your life has changed and you're on the right course, I believe, and I think you believe, that the scriptures teach that once you're truly in God's family, you are an adopted son or daughter, and he keeps you in his family. Yeah. Romans 8 talks about how nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so I, I believe, and there is some debate among theologians of how to interpret certain scriptures, but, but I believe, and I think this church believes, that once someone truly is in Christ, they stay that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, here's a second video. Well, we're not going to show the video, actually, because we had an audio problem with the video. But I think the question is so good, I'll just read the question that someone sent uh, video to us. They said, are there sources outside the Bible that point to the Bible being true? Could you give some examples? And the answer is yes. There's a proliferation both of documentary evidence that confirms and corroborates certain points in the Bible, as well as archaeological discoveries that have confirmed biblical claims and biblical um, uh, descriptions and things like that. So, for instance, we have people who actually sat under the teachings of John and Peter and the other apostles, 
And they wrote letters in the first century and in the beginning of the second century in which they said, hey, I'm paraphrasing, but hey, I know John. I know Peter. And guess what? The resurrection is true. They told me. Here's what they told me. And, and, uh, and they so wrote the books they claimed to write. Yeah, I mean, so they're confirming this stuff and um, people who actually knew the, the apostles. So you have that. You have secular sources, Josephus, Tacitus, and others from the early uh, Roman world and Greek um, world who confirm certain things in the Bible. My favorite is a guy named Thallus. Because when I was a skeptic and I read the Bible and it talked about darkness falling over the earth at the time of the crucifixion, I thought, give me a break. Don't you think somebody else would have noticed if the earth had gone dark during part of the crucifixion? So I thought that was just hyperbole or something made up. And yet, Thallus, who was a Greek historian who wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world from the Trojan War, he wrote it in 52 AD, um, specifically mentions the darkness that fell over the earth, and he tries to explain it away by saying, oh, it was an eclipse of the sun, but we know scientifically it couldn't have been an eclipse of the sun. So there we have secular confirmation of a biblical event. Another, and we've had several cases where people have, have doubted, like I did, biblical claims, and archaeology has later confirmed those claims. I'll give you an example in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, he refers to a guy named Licinius, who he identifies as the tetrarch of a place called Abilene in 27 AD. And people used to make fun of Luke, say, well, that just shows Luke doesn't know what he's talking about, because everybody knows Licinius was a king, and he was executed 50 years before that. Until a few years ago, 14 miles west-northwest of Damascus in an area that was known as Abilene in the first century, they found an inscription to Licinius, the Tetrarch of Abilene, just as Luke has said. Turned out there were two Licinius's or Licinii, or whatever you call it, multiple Licinius's, but plural. They're, they're a plural, there were two of them. So in fact, just last week, archaeologists announced that they had discovered the uh, old Philistine city of, uh, city of Ziklag, which is mentioned several times in the Old Testament, it's where David went um, when he fled uh, King Saul, and just another Biblical city reference confirmed again by archaeology. If, if I could just sum up just why this is so important. A lot of us grew up being told the Bible's true because it says it's true. Mm. And okay, and it, it does say it's true, and I, you know, but, but that by itself would be circular reasoning. Yeah. Just to say, well, you know, it's true because it says it's true. Well, the Quran says it's true, and the Book of Mormon says it's true. And, you know, that, that's not a way to prove yeah. something. You need outside evidence. And what we're saying is, we have historical, secular evidence. We have archaeological evidence. We have all kinds of ways that we can confirm at least the broad contours of what is taught in this book, as yeah. well as internal evidence and so forth. So right. So if you're interested in that topic, which is a fascinating topic, um, one of our friends, Dr. Gary Habermas, who's an historian, uh, wrote a book called The Historical Jesus. And in that book, he cites 39 ancient sources from which he enumerates over 100 facts about the life, teachings, miracles, and death of, and resurrection of Jesus uh, from these ancient sources outside the Bible. Uh, so that uh, answer that question. Okay, number three. Here's a big question. Let's play video number three. I think something that most people struggle with, I guess, or always question is how could a good God that loves us so much and has so much power allow us to go through bad times and what does that look like in his perspective and how he can love us through those times? Yeah, this is the number one question that people ask. We, uh, I actually did a survey, a national survey, and asked people, if you could ask God one question and you knew he'd give you an answer right now, what would you ask him? And by a factor of 20, uh, the number one question is, why does God allow pain and suffering? And some people have this question because it's an intellectual conundrum for them. The others ask it out of their own pain. Right. And we've had several people who wrote out of their own pain and things they're going through saying, why does God allow this? So, Mark, uh, help us deal with this issue. Yeah, I mean, on more of the, kind of the intellectual side of yeah. this, um, it is a tough question. But I think the assumption people make is if God is loving and powerful, he wouldn't let us suffer or he would get rid of evil. And they just want him to, you know, take care of it. But they don't understand the bigger picture. And that is, if you read the Bible and really understand the Christian worldview, he did create a world without sin and evil. 
Um, but we fell and we, we disobeyed God. He, he created us free because he wanted us to be able to truly love him. But then in our freedom, we went the other way and rebelled against him. And you know, people say, well, why did he make us that way? Why did he make us so we would love him? Well, if you force love, it's not for really love anymore. In fact, there is no such thing. The idea of forced love, that's an oxymoron. It's a contradiction of terms. Love is always free. But if it's free, then you have the, the ability to choose not to engage in it or to go the other way. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden back in Genesis. And we've been doing it ever since. So we're in a world where it's not the way God intended, but it, it's a byproduct of him giving us freedom. And that has resulted in moral evil. It's resulted in natural evil. It's resulted in a cosmos that is not the way it's designed to be. And we live in this big parentheses period of pain and suffering that eventually he's going to fix and, and resolve and make it all right and dry every tear and everyone who's followed him will be in his presence in you know, heaven for eternity. But in the middle, we're in a mess. And the Bible, what I like about the Bible, again, it's realistic about this. Jesus said it's in John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you're going to suffer. You're going to have trials and tribulations. So he tells us the truth. Unlike some religions, some Eastern religions that say, oh, that's all illusory, it's not real. No, Jesus goes, it's real, it's all too real. But take heart, he goes on, I have overcome the world. In other words, I'm not going to take you out of it, I'm not going to promise you no pain or suffering in your life, but I can walk you through it. If you will draw near to me, I'll draw near to you and I will carry you through. I will help you face what you're going to have to face. Yeah. Now, you know, for those who really are yourself suffering with a, um, an issue that's causing you to ask this question, um, you know, we as a church want to be with you. We want to help you. We want to encourage you. And after the service at all the campuses, uh, if you want personal prayer, the Bible talks in James about um, anointing with oil and praying for people who are sick, who are hurting. Uh, if you're hurting, if you're sick, if you uh, want uh, prayer and anointing personally for you, just come up after the service. We have pastors here who will be glad to do that. And that's part of what the community of Christ is together, to encourage each yeah, other. Because a lot of times what we need is not an answer intellectually, but we need ministry. We need yeah. you know, companionship. We need Christians who care and will hold our hands or pray with us. And uh, it's great. that's why I love doing these things in the context of a church where there's both truth and love in ministries. Yeah, good balance. Um, here's a question that came in. My husband is searching really hard, but has questions I can't answer. And she attached to this uh, email um, a PDF with... I don't know how many pages of apparent Bible contradictions and, and inconsistencies that are bothering this guy as he's on his journey. And, and so uh, there were, I don't know, maybe a hundred of them or so. And uh, so we can't get to all of them. So I picked one to give an example. Okay, what do you do when you're faced with a question like this? Are there answers? And the, ans and the, question, and the answer to that is, yeah, there are answers. You're not going to find, I guarantee you, you're not going to find an inconsistency in the Bible or an error in the Bible that has not been um, talked about for the last 2,000 years. There are entire encyclopedias that have been written to deal with apparent contradictions in the Bible. So, uh, you know, none of this is new, but they're, they're important issues because if they're truly a sticking point, they need to be dealt with. So I just picked one to say, okay, here's an example of how one of these questions might be answered. And the question is, okay, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, it says that Mary Magdalene and a number of other women, uh, one or more, uh, went with her to the tomb of Jesus after his crucifixion. But John, in John 20, verse 1, only mentions Mary Magdalene. So is that an error? Is that a contradiction? And the answer is no, it isn't really a contradiction. And the reason is, um, if you understand the context of how ancient writings were produced, um, there's a technique, and it was used then in Plutarch and other ancient historians, but it's used today. It's a technique called literary spotlighting. And what that means is, you know, if, if we put a spotlight on Mark all of a sudden and I was in darkness and all you could really see is Mark because we want to really emphasize and give Mark an opportunity to highlight him and what he's saying, it's not denying that I'm there. 
Um, it's just highlighting Mark. And so, for instance, if I were to go home and say to Leslie, hey, um, uh, we had a great service this morning. I was there with Mark. Well, that'd be true. Mark and I were here, but you all were here too. But I didn't mention you because I wanted to mention she knows Mark and she'd be interested in that. So, um, this so is, you're giving different levels of detail. Yeah, that's right. It, exactly. He didn't say only Mary Magdalene was there. It's the only one he mentions. But if you read the next verse, it says, So Mary Magdalene ran to John and Peter and said, quote, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Hmm. Well, who's the we? It's the others that were with her that he isn't mentioning because he's spotlighting Mary Magdalene. So it's not a consistency, in, an inconsistency in any way. Um, not every account is as complete as others. Some choose to mention one aspect of something. And that's and just that's the true. nature of all eyewitness testimony. Exactly. In fact, one of the greatest scholars in um, American um, um, legal history, uh, Simon Greenleaf, pointed out that those kind of apparent indiscri indiscri or, uh, discrepancies, which aren't really, but they look like it, are actually in favor of the accuracy of the Bible because true eyewitness testimony always looks at things, every eyewitness looks at things a little differently. And if they all said the exact same thing, you would know they had gotten together and colluded in advance to make sure they eliminated any inconsistency. And you'd know that something was fishy. But the fact that it, the Bible allows each, per, each eyewitness to kind of mention what they want to witness or, or report contributes to the accuracy uh, of the Bible. Nobody's saying that's the only people that were there. It's a, here's some people I'm going to mention. Another uh, objection that he raised is this. According to biblical scholars, genealogies and events in the Bible indicate that everything in the universe was created in one week less than 10,000 years ago. Hmm. However, there is a scientific consensus based on overwhelming evidence that that is not correct. What do you say, what do you say to that? Oh, this would be an example where people set up a, a, a particular view, and then if anyone can disagree with it, then they call it a contradiction in the Bible. The problem is that particular view is not stated in the Bible, particularly that the earth is a certain number of years old. The Bible doesn't give us dates of when God created, and, uh, and I always have to tell people, if you have one of the old King James Bibles where you go to Genesis 1 and it says 4004 B.C. at creation... That was not in Genesis. That is not biblical. That is something that the publisher added based on an interpretation. Uh, and a lot of people confuse that note with thinking that's in Scripture. It's not. Uh, now, what it's based on, as, as he indicates, is an adding up of the lengths of the lives of the people in the genealogies. But many people have pointed out the problems with that, and that is genealogies um, the way they were used in the ancient world and in, including in the Bible is they would say so-and-so begat so-and-so and then that person begat so-and-so. But they often skip whole generations. In fact, if you look in your New Testament, the very first chapter in Matthew 1 sums up the genealogies from the beginning to Jesus and it's like it's skipping in some cases, like hundreds of years in between. And so what the language means when it says begat so-and-so, it means they're of the lineage of. In fact, Jesus is sometimes called the son of David. But David lived a thousand years before Jesus. But it's, it's just saying he's of the lineage of David. So you have to be very careful with, with dating, you know, like especially creation, uh, based on adding up genealogies. The Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is, and Christians are very divided. And I would say the majority of scholarly Christians would say, the Bible, you know, the Bible doesn't give us any idea. The earth may be very, very old. And so it's not a biblical contradiction. So there's an umbrella of orthodoxy in Christianity where Bible-believing Christians um, have different perspectives on the issue of the age of the earth. And there are some who believe the earth is young, there are some who believe the earth is old, but they all agree on the fundamentals, which is that God uh, created all that there is. He created us in his likeness. We are accountable to him because he created us and, and so forth. And so those kind of fundamental issues, are everybody agrees to those. Um, the yeah. actual age is a matter of some dispute, but you can, you can be a Bible-believing Christian and believe 
uh, that the, the earth is 4 billion years old and the universe is 14 billion years old. Um, and, and my plea on that, just as kind of a side note to us as believers, is let's not fight over the age of the earth. I mean, that's kind of an inner mural skirmish thing. Let's unite and fight the real enemy, and that is scientific naturalism, which is basically an atheistic view of science that says there's no creator, there's no designer, you know, this is all random, it's all by chance. That's the enemy. I mean, that's, and, and I think that's what both scripture and good science, you know, would militate against. Yeah. So let, let's focus on, on that, not on fighting each other on these fine points. Okay, here's another written question that came in. Uh, Jesus claimed to be the son of man. What does that really mean? Yeah, a lot of people think that that means he's human. That's what I thought. When I was a, an atheist and I began reading the Bible, I, I realized, okay, Mark is the oldest gospel, and what's the most common way that Jesus refers to himself in Mark? Son of man. So I said, well, look, he's just claiming to be a man like everybody else. Well, what I didn't realize at the time and had to learn is that what Jesus was doing is applying to himself a passage uh, from the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 7, verses uh, 13 and 14. And if you go to that passage, you will see that the Son of Man is a divine figure. Uh, he, is, he comes in judgment of the world. He is in the very presence of the Father. He has sovereign power He is in glory. He is worshipped. Only God is authentically worshipped. He has a, a, a dominion that will be everlasting. These are divine characteristics. And so Jesus was taking this Son of Man figure from the Old Testament. And, of course, the Jewish audience that he was talking to understood what he was saying. Yeah, they freaked out when he yeah, said Yeah, they freaked you know, out. Because they got the implication. Yeah. Yeah, so it was a clear claim to deity. Right. In fact, what's interesting is he also called himself the Son of God, which was a claim to deity. Yeah. So both of those terms, Son of God, Son of Man, both point to the fact that he is a divine person, exactly. God, God incarnate, as we say at Christmas time. Here's, here's one that came in, Mark. I think it's fundamental uh, to understand. <clears throat> Please help me know what is faith according to the Bible? Yeah, you know, that's, that's one of those terms we banter around. And sometimes people who are skeptical, um, the atheist community will say, well, you know, we, we have reason and science and knowledge. You guys just have, like, faith and superstition and that kind of thing. And uh, people like Richard Dawkins define faith or try to define it for us. They'll say faith is believing in something even though there's no evidence for it. Or as one person said, even though you know it couldn't be true. And I just want to ask, do any of you believe in Christianity because you know it couldn't be true? I mean, I, I've never met a Christian that would say that. Or that, you know, I believe it even though there's no evidence for it. That is not at all what faith is. And so we got to be careful not to let others define what, what we believe. Um, faith, if you want a simple synonym for faith, it's the word trust. And what's interesting, once you understand faith is trusting in something, hopefully something that's trustworthy. But once you understand that, you realize we all have faith. I mean, in, in everyday ways, you had faith this morning in the barista at the coffee shop and that he or she was making something safe for you to drink. Uh, you had faith as you drove here that people would stay on their side of the road and apparently it worked out, you're here. Um, we live by that kind of everyday faith. It's trust in the, the way things normally work. But we also, all of us, not just us as Christians, but everyone has faith in some kind of an ultimate reality. Uh, in other words, we have faith that, you know, if you're a Christian, that faith, faith in Christ as our savior, our forgiver, our leader. And Muslims have faith in Muhammad's teachings and so on. But atheists have faith too. And here, what I mean is, again, faith is trust. They trust that their assumptions about the universe are accurate, that there is no creator, that there is no higher moral standard that they're going to be held accountable to. There is no judgment day. And I think they have faith in that in spite of the evidence against it. And so I think, really, that they're the ones that have kind of a blind faith. That's why I like the title of that book. It's, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Because I don't have enough trust in what they believe because I think the evidence points toward Christianity. Yeah. So I, to me, faith is exactly what you said. It is, follow, it is 
a, a step that we take, a step of trust in the same direction the evidence is pointing. We have all these, and you talk about in your books, 20 lines of evidence that point toward the truth of Christianity. And as we, as we follow those lines of evidence, yes, we take a step of faith, but it's in the same direction the evidence is flowing. That's logical. That's rational. We yes. do that every day. Yep. Um, here's one that we got. <laughs> Say, do you go to hell if you have tattoos? Well, <laughs> let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> People are getting nervous. Yeah, They're covering like, up yeah, their cover. arms. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what creates this question, I think. If you go to the Old Testament, to Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verse 28, this is the way the NIV translates it. Uh, Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Well, that seems to raise a cut question and dry, there, isn't doesn't it? it? That's kind of cut and dry. There's some problems with that. Here's the truth. The Bible does not address the appropriateness of the kind of tattoos we're talking about today. A better, more literal reading of that verse is this. And a cutting for the dead you will not make in your flesh, and writing marks you will not make on you. Now, they, they translated writing marks in this version as saying tattoos, but they weren't talking about the same thing in the ancient world. The Egyptian, a lot of women would um, uh, cut themselves or inscribe on themselves um, um, uh, images of the fertility goddess that they think would help them get pregnant. Um, the Canaanites would slash themselves and brand themselves um, and, and do it in honor of the dead. So or these were acts of pagan worship. Pagan worship, exactly. That's what it's talking so about. So you shouldn't there. do a tattoo of a pagan yeah, god. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, <laughs> So the Bible doesn't directly address what we know today to be tattoos. By the way, the word tattoo didn't come into common usage until the 1700s. So, um, therefore, because it's not specifically addressed in Scripture, we have to use scriptural principles to try to determine and, and go by our own conscience whether or not this is something we want to do and to weigh things like um, what kind of tattoo would you want to have? The Bible talks about our body being a temple of, of God, temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to deface that. Um, um, uh, so what kind of a tattoo would you have? Now, we, Mark and I just yesterday ran into a guy and had a big t uh, tattoo on his arm that was reflective of a biblical image. And we said, well, that's an interesting tattoo. And, we, and, and he used it as an opportunity to talk about the Lord. Yeah, he said it raises spiritual conversations all the time. Yeah. and, and many Like Christians, a tract on his arm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> many Christians find that. If they have something that uh, causes people to ask questions, um, then it, they can get into a spiritual conversation. But this is not something that's addressed specifically in the Bible. I think it's left up to individual Christians how they want to approach it under their own conscience. And um, I just would say that whatever we do ought to glorify God. So no, you don't want to have a pagan image of a fertility goddess. Um, but it, it, I, I would, my advice would be, if you were going to have a tattoo, to have something that would be uh, glorifying to God and, and might open spiritual conversations. But no, the answer to the question is, do you go to hell if you have tattoos? The answer is no. <laughs> Not because of that, anyway. <laughs> now, here's another one that a lot of people ask, Mark. Brooke wrote in this and said, uh, how can you tell if you've had a dream where God communicates with you versus a regular dream? Yeah, you know, that, that might sound kind of funny to our Western ears, but in this ancient world and in a lot of the Middle Eastern world, there's a real emphasis on getting revelations, hearing from God. And I know you wrote about in your book, The Case for Miracles, about the phenomenon happening in the Muslim world where many, you know, many hundreds of Muslims are having dreams of Jesus. Yeah. And they're very biblical dreams, and they're, they're, they, they wake up and they go, I, I'm never going to view Jesus the same again. And many of them end up becoming Christians. So um, it's not a far-fetched question. God can work in mysterious ways. Uh, I think what we have to do is test it. There's a verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 that says, you know, when, when you hear a prophetic utterance where when someone says, you know, here, I have a word for you from the Lord, it says, don't, don't just write it off, but don't just accept it either. It, the verse is, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22. It says, test these things very carefully. And when it says to test them, it's like test it against what you know to be true from God's word. 
Because if so, you, know, you have a dream and it tells you to follow a pagan god or something, it's not from God. It's just very clear. Um, or to, it tells you to commit adultery with someone. Well, that's outside of God's will. Um, but if it's more, you know, God's leading you and he wants you to talk to a person. Or, you know, again, if you're not a Christian and you have a dream and it's like God's calling you. Well, you had something like that as, when you were... When you I know. was a child, I had a prophetic dream that came true, what, 30 years later, 25 years later um, in my life, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, God can use that, but it will always square with what he says in his revelation, the Bible. That's yeah, you know, in the test. case of these Muslim dreams, it's important to understand that there's always um, uh, an outside corroboration in these dreams. So what will happen, give you an example, there's a woman in Egypt. She had a dream. Jesus appeared to her in the dream. Uh, it was an incredible, she felt his love, and it was an overwhelming kind of a dream. And she said, tell me more about you. And Jesus said, well, my friend will tell you. And she looked, and there was a man in her dreams um, that Jesus was referring to. The next day, she goes to the crowded marketplace in Cairo on a Friday, and uh, all of a sudden, she sees that man from her dream. Yeah, with the same glasses, same, same gla shirt. Same face, same shirt, same clothes, and she goes up to him and says, you're the one, you're the one. He said, whoa, whoa, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> you're the, you were in my dream. And, she, and then he said, did you have a dream about Jesus? And she said, Yes. And he said, oh, well, let me but tell you about you. He was a missionary. Here. <laughs> and, and, yeah, he said, and he pulled her aside and, and opened the Bible and told her about Jesus. So there, there's some outside corroboration. And this stuff there. is happening a lot. It is. I have a chapter in my book, The Case for Miracles, if you're interested, that documents a lot of these dreams. They are incredible supernatural experiences. Okay, uh, how about question number five on the video? Would the theory of evolution say play anywhere into Christianity and if so how yeah what about does evolution have anything to say about Christianity and, and I'll just echo what Mark said is that the, the problem with the theory of evolution is that if you look at a definition in a textbook it will define it as being random undirected without plan or purpose so you're ruling out God at the beginning by defining it that way um, that's called scientific materialism, that all that is, is are the things we can touch and, and feel and so forth. So, um, no, I mean, if you define evolution that way... Um, it's atheistic. It's, at, it's, it's in the definition, it's atheistic. What's tricky about it is the word evolution is so broad. That's right. Because it, it basically says things change. Yeah. Well, I believe things change. Of course. Um, and in fact, much of what Darwin discovered and then used to form his theory were legitimate observations of real changes happening in the, you know, the beaks of the finches and on the oh, islands where right. he was. Yeah. Um, or the changes in moths in, in England and, and so forth. It's like, okay, yeah, there, there are adaptations within the species. Um, and a lot of times people call that microevolution or horizontal evolution. But that doesn't necessarily make true the broader theory that because microevolution happens, therefore macroevolution, you know, that therefore all living things came from one organism and so on. I have problems with that both scientifically and biblically. Yeah. And so, by the way, theory of evolution does not deal with how life came into being in the first place. Yeah, it doesn't answer that. And I, yeah, that's a good point. I often point out, and I actually have a chapter on it in the questions book that you mentioned earlier, that you know, even if evolution were true, and I have already said I, I don't buy the theory of macro evolution, but it still wouldn't answer how the cosmos got here. How, where did you get the raw materials? Uh, you need... You know, whatever has a beginning has a cause. There's a whole argument on this. And the universe had a beginning. The universe needs an outside cause. And the best answer for that is that there is a God who caused it. Um, so evolution wouldn't answer that. It doesn't answer where first life came from, as right. you said. It also doesn't answer where all the information in the genetic code. I mean, wherever there's code, there's a code writer. Anyone in computer world knows that. And yet the most fantastic code is written in every cell of our bodies in the DNA. And so you go, you know, evolution doesn't answer any of that. It doesn't also answer the origin of human consciousness. Right. I mean, so it's just fraught with problems. And it, it just doesn't come anywhere close to really explaining how we got here. I think the Bible does a whole lot better job of saying, you know, you see all this design. Well, there's a designer behind it. Now, there are some Christians who are called theistic evolutionists. 
And uh, Francis Collins, for instance, who was the evangelical Christian who cracked the genetic code uh, for the government, um, is a uh, theistic evolutionist. And what that means is they believe that God orchestrated uh, evolution. So in other words, uh, it wasn't really undirected and without plan or purpose, but there was, there was a creator behind it who used the evolutionary processes to um, uh, come up with human beings and the world as we see it today. Um, I'm not a theistic yeah, evolutionist. that's not our position. I don't think that's where the evidence of, of science or theology sure. point. But these are Bible-believing folks who are scientists who have that view. It's under the umbrella of orthodoxy we talked about before. And um, so... Um, so again, I think those aren't, those aren't really where we want to fight the battle. It's yeah, more agree. with the, the presupposition of atheism that says it's always undirected, uncaused, uh, you know, or at least caused by natural causes. And I think the evidence points to a cause outside the universe, an intelligent designer that the Bible tells us a whole lot more about. Yeah. Let's, uh, if, if someone here has a question, um, we have microphones over here and over here. I can't really see where they are, but I know what that, oh, there we go. There's a mic, and uh, here's a mic. So if you have a question, um, feel free. Just, you know, we're looking for something that has a broad interest, that's a legitimate sticking point in your journey. Um, so we'll wait and see if anybody comes up, and we'll try to do as many of those as we can. In the meantime, let's do a couple quick ones, Mark. Uh, Karen says, um, why is it often said in the Bible that we should fear God? Doesn't this contradict the fact that God is love and perfect love knows no fear? Well, first, it's a good question. Um, first of all, perfect love entails having received that love and responded to the creator. So for someone who rejects his offer of salvation, rejects the gospel, they have much to fear. And, you know, the book of Hebrews talks about it's, a, it's an awful thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. I mean, so he is a righteous judge, and we're sinners. So that gives us something to be concerned about right away. Um, now, if you turn to him and you receive his grace and forgiveness, and you're adopted into his family, then you don't have to fear the judgment. You do not have to fear hell or, you know, punishment in the end. So what does it mean when it says fear the Lord? Well, but I think for all of us, there is a deep respect. Um, I think of the scene in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe where Lucy um, is getting to know Aslan. And Aslan, if you know the story, he represents Jesus. And she at one point asks uh, another character in the story, is, is, is he safe? And the, this other character says, no, he's not safe, but he's good. And I think we need to get a picture of God that says he is good, he is loving, but he's an awesome God and he is holy and he is just. And, and we need reverence and awe of the almighty God and a much deeper respect than I think is normally understood in our culture. So uh, you'd maybe substitute the word if you were to uh, do that. Reverence and awe for fear. Fear meaning for those of us who are his followers, as we yeah. are in his presence, it's a it's a reverence. It's an awe. And if you're awe. not a, if you're not a follower, his you have something to be afraid yeah. of. But the good news is he has provided the solution through Christ. And turn yeah. to him. Okay. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, yes, my name is John. Uh, this is not a gotcha question. I'm a child of God here. But yeah. uh, my question revolves around what some might view as the intersection of science and faith in the triune yeah. gone, right? Um, we talked about the genealogical length of the timeline of the earth. I don't have a problem with that. I like the answer that was given. But a subset to that, you know, the Bible talks about people living hundreds of years. Yeah. We don't live hundreds of years today. but I'm working my, on it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm working I, on it. I asked that question because we live, we live in a local community here of a lot of scientists, yeah. right? So we've got oil and gas, chemists, medicine. Sure. So I think some people might be struggling with that. Yeah, that's a great question, I think. Mark, how, I mean, that comes up from time to time. Yeah, and I, I think it means what it says. I mean, I, I think people apparently used to live a lot longer. There's theories about that. Um, some people say, well, the genetic... Breakdown. Breakdown got worse and worse over time, and so we don't live as long now as we did then, though now we have vitamins and exercise and so <laughs> forth, living longer than three generations ago. But compared to back then, uh, we're just, we don't have the same makeup and that they lived longer back then. I don't know if that's the right 
answer to it, but I do think the Bible's literal when it talks about people living hundreds of years. I, I think one of the, you know, it's an interesting topic because there's no external corroboration you can go to to try to confirm that one way or the other. And so what I do is I look at the other confirmations that do give me confidence in the reliability of Scripture and say, okay, based on all that, I believe it's, it's essentially accurate in what it tells me, so I'm going to trust them on that and kind of hold that in abeyance. Um, which I think is legitimate based on the other evidence that shows the general reliability. And it's the kind of question we can ask in heaven, you know. We're all going to have our hand up in heaven. Hey, Jesus, and, and that's a great one to add. I hope you'll ask that. And what's the deal, you know? Um, <laughs> but I think I agree with Mark that perhaps it was, a, you know, genetic breakdown back then had not been as pr pronounced as over the centuries it got. And maybe uh, with the pure genetics, people did um, on occasion live that long. For the record, I don't want to live to be a thousand. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> right. I, sometimes I feel like I'm a thousand. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, how should the Old Covenant with the Jewish nation, uh, the Old Testament, affect our daily walk as believers in Christ today? Yeah, that is a great question. In fact, we had a um, video question. I won't take the... Uh, time to show, um, but exactly that same question. So that's a, a very good question. How do people, like the, the one that came in the video says, uh, parts of the Bible apply differently to different people. For instance, how do we read things like Leviticus and apply it to our lives today? Yeah, and I think we have to let Scripture interpret Scripture because there are certainly like di dietary laws and certain things that were for the Jewish people at that time, partly I think to keep them distinct as a nation until the Messiah would come through their lineage. Um, some of them I think to protect their health at that time. Uh, but then some of those were reversed. If you read in Acts chapter 10, uh, where Peter is on the rooftop and he has the vision three times where uh, all these different animals are let down. And it's like God saying, okay, pork is okay now. Shellfish is okay now. So in biblical history, there was a reversal of certain things. And I think we have to say, okay, then there, this is now permissible through God's revelation. But that doesn't change the fact that God is still a holy God as revealed in the Old Testament. The and moral teachings. The moral teachings and, and principles that are there. But it's, it's a hermeneutic issue which has to do with interpretation of Scripture. And I think we're always best to let Scripture interpret Scripture rather than say, well, that's, you know, we're, that's old-fashioned mm -hmm. and we're smarter than that now. That's, I think, where the church gets in danger and when we start thinking we're smarter or more modern than Scripture and so we can now change things because that's, that's not cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, great. Okay, let's do one more question. Thank you, ma'am. One more and then we're, we're set. Yes, ma'am. I don't even know if there's any living prophets in today's day. Oh, good question. Are there, there so-called prophets today? Yeah, there's a lot of controversy and debate in theological circles of that. I don't think anyone would say, well, most people wouldn't say we have apostles with the same authority as what, you know, the original apostles of Jesus had. Um, but there are a lot of movements, especially in the more charismatic uh, circles, that would say, well, we have something very similar, and certainly people that are moved by the Holy Spirit who speak for God, and, um, and often the, <laughs> there are some very amazing things that um, they're able to uh, say or challenge people or help give direction. But I think we have to be cautious. And again, I go to that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5 that says, don't write it off. I mean, when someone comes and says, I have a prophetic word, I say, well, let's hear it, but then I'm going to test it. And I'm going to test it against what I know to be true from God's word. So uh, I, th I think God has not lost his voice. I think he can speak to us through each other. I think the Bible does give room for that, but it also gives plenty of cautions so that we don't get carried away by some new teaching or some new revelation that does contradict this. In fact, I'll add one more. Uh, Galatians 1, 8, and 9, Paul warns, you know, even if someone coming claiming to be an apostle, this is Galatians 1, 8, and 9, or an angel from heaven comes and gives you a gospel that's a different gospel than the biblical one, he says, let him be accursed. Do not listen to him. Do not follow him. And yet we have re whole religions that have started with supposed revelations from angels or people who claim to be apostles. So that test of scripture is the all-important thing.
Great. Let's thank Mark for, uh, and thank you, ma'am, for your question. Thank you. Did you enjoy doing this? Was this helpful? Um, you know, I, I think it's something we should do periodically and give people an opportunity to, to express the questions on your heart. So uh, let me pray, and we'll just, uh, no, we have something right afterwards, but uh, let me pray. Father, thank you for the truth that you have given us through your word. Uh, thank you. We can stand on it. We can have confidence in it. We can build our lives upon it. We know that the doors of heaven have been flung open because your word tells us that salvation is available as a free gift of grace to all who receive it in repentance and faith. And we pray even at this moment, there might be those in this very place who in their hearts say, Lord, I, I need to come to you. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who proved it by returning from the dead. And I want to turn from that and receive your free gift of grace and become your child forever. So we pray for those that take that step today and thank you that you have given us guidance and wisdom for our everyday lives and for these tough questions that are sure to come up and vex us. And may we help our friends who have questions as well to pursue answers to satisfy their hearts and souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.